love conquers all. Uh, it overcomes prison walls. It overcomes uh, separation. Uh, it overcomes sickness. It overcomes addiction. addiction. It overcomes bad relationships. It yes, overcomes yes. dead end jobs. Yes. It overcomes uh, poor business choices. It overcomes failed business practices. Uh, the whole nine yards. We just have to, as Fox said, of employ love as the strategy. The future of work isn't about shareholder value, technology, metrics, or automation. It's about being human and putting people first through actionable love. Welcome to the Love in Action podcast, where we hold deep conversations with extraordinary people to help you grow as a leader and expand your business. Here's your host, Marcel Schwantes. Hey, welcome to the show. Glad you are here and thank you for spending time with us. I'm excited about today's show because I believe, well, it's going to be unlike any other episode that we've ever had. I mean, we're 180 episodes deep, okay? So that's saying a lot. And, and the reason I say this is because, you know, few shows we do here actually place the, the focus of love on justice and perseverance and resilience. I mean, and even faith. So we're gonna hear a story today about how radical love can pull us through the worst of times. And, and let me tell you, I don't think most of us have ever gone through something as heart-wrenching and challenging and, and have endured as long a battle as today's guests did. So, so let me set this up. Back in 2020, a documentary film came out called Time. Some of you may remember that. Time was an Academy Award nominated film for best documentary. So the documentary follows Sybil Fox Richardson. I'm gonna to refer to her as Fox. And she is fighting for the release of her husband, Rob Richardson, who is serving a 60 year prison sentence for participating in an armed bank robbery. Now, this was Rob's first offense and he ended up serving more than two decades in America's bloodiest penitentiary, that would be Angola, until he received clemency in 2018. There's a lot more to that story because the documentary, well, it exposes America's broken prison system. So I wanna point you to go watch Time. You can find it streaming on Amazon Prime. Now. I don't want to overshare in my introduction because it would do this couple an injustice because their story is so compelling and we're going to hear their accounts firsthand shortly okay but let me let me just say this fox was separated from her husband for 21 years uh while raising six boys as a single mom but also during this whole time she relentlessly pursued justice advocating against a system designed to keep her husband in prison. And that brings up a lot of questions about the injustices that may still be going on today. I have questions about what was the motive for Rob having to go and rob a bank? There's a story about that too, a backstory that we're going to hear. And I think the most important thing, if we're going to bring love into the conversation, is how did their relationship survive while Rob was in prison 21 years? Well, they decided to write a book that tells the rest of their story. So in never before shared details, Fox and Rob reveal what the documentary film does not stories of resilience and even miracles and and faith that kind of carried them through all those years now a bit about this amazing couple sybil fox and robert richardson are a new orleans based couple as i mentioned they have six sons and they continue their advocacy for incarcerated families through the nola chapter of participatory defense which they founded with the vision of changing lives and laws through love. They also founded Rich Family Ministries, dedicated to empowering marriages to thrive. And as part of their efforts there, they launched an initiative designed to provide families, communities, and the accused 
with legal awareness as the best form of defense, empowering these people to be more actively engaged in their own legal matter. Because Rob has a lot to say about this since he had to go through the system. And now Fox and Rob join us. And I am so thrilled that you are here. It's such an honor. Welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you, you for so having much us. for having us. You know, typically I, I, I start every show with the question, you know, what's your story? But I'm going to I'm not going to do that because, you know, this whole episode is going to be about your story. So, <laughs> but I but I, what I do know is that every story has a beginning. So before we dive into the the dramatic moments of, you know, a, a bank robbery and a, a 60 year jail sentence and all that, I want you guys to take us back to just what was life like in your 20s, because you had a business that you wanted to start, which kind of unraveled this whole road that led to these other events. So what's a good starting point for this discussion? Probably a good starting point would be, uh, well, first and foremost, uh, Marcel, again, thank you uh, for having us on the show. This is uh, indeed a uh, an amazing opportunity uh, to be able to not only talk with you, uh, but at the same time, being able to talk to uh, to your audience, your viewers as well. So again, uh, thank you uh, so much for having us on the show. My but pleasure. Think, uh, a great starting point would uh, be uh, when, when uh, Boy Meets Girl. Uh, we met in 1987 as a uh, as a young couple. Uh, we were basically 17 and 18, respectively, 16, 16 and 18, respectively. And I was home uh, uh, on leave uh, from the uh, from the U.S. Navy. Uh, I came home and while there uh, ended up getting a phone call from a mutual friend of, uh, of Fox and I. And um, they were in need of a ride uh, to go to school. There's a part of this story that differs, depends on which one of us you ask. Uh, but I'm just going to give you the uh, my version of the story. And that is, is that uh, I came uh, in in, uh, in an effort uh, to uh, give them a ride back to uh, to the school that they uh, that they were that they were. Uh, we were taking skipping. a mental health day. From school. <laughs> right. And I was just saying that they were uh, playing hooky that day. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what they called it back in my day. Right. <laughs> Uh, but it was a mental health day for the two of them. <laughs> yes. And uh, at any rate, uh, they were in need of a ride to uh, make it back to the uh, to the school. And uh, so uh, the mutual friend between the two of us gave me a call and Rob's asked me to come by member. and uh, pick uh, pick him up. So uh, I came by the house, knocked on the door, me and a friend of mine uh, who was also home visiting uh, on on, uh, on leave. And uh, we knocked at the door. And uh, what I say is uh, an angel answered the door. Uh, one of those things to me that was love at first sight. I spent probably the rest of the day trying to convince Fox that she was equally in love with me as I was with her. And uh, I think uh, I wore it out, you know, and uh, <laughs> what ultimately ended up uh, happening as a result of that is that uh, Fox and I had a uh, 10 year on again, off again uh, relationship that we maintained with uh, one another, uh, even during the off again periods that we were not necessarily um one another's boyfriend and girlfriend, we've always maintained our friendship, even when we had other people that we uh, that were wearing the titles of uh, our boyfriend or girlfriend, respectively. And um, with that said, uh, during that period, I was overseas uh, at an overseas post in uh, Holy Lock, Scotland, where I was doing a, a tour of duty there. And uh, Fox and I talked back and forth, um, you know, countlessly uh, over the phone. I was impressed by her uh, many uh, ways that she was able to, you know, do uh, do the remarkable. One such remarkable thing was is that I had uh, I had duty on a tugboat that is in the middle of the water in Holy Lock, Scotland. And all of a sudden, this little rickety phone on the wall rings and it's like. It's one of those phones that got the whining thing on it. And me and my other shipmates, none of us had ever heard the phone ring before. And so we were all kind of sitting there looking at each other in the galley, uh, trying to figure out, should we answer it? <laughs> so finally, uh, one of my partners picks up the phone. And when he picks up the phone, he says a few words. And he's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, well, hold on. And then he turns around and, you know, everybody uh, in the military generally refers to you by your last name. So uh, for my last name being Richardson, he called me Rich, you know, and uh, he said, Rich, the uh, phone is for you. I'm like, phone is for me? What do you mean the phone is for me? <laughs> thing doesn't even work. <laughs> we've been on the phone for months. We've never heard the phone ring. 
So he gives me the phone. And when he gives me the phone of all of the people that could have been on the other end of the phone, it was Fox. And I was trying to figure out how in the hell did she <laughs> figure out how to not only reach me in Holy Lock, Scotland at 16 years of age, 17, 17 years of age, but she had figured out how to reach me on a tugboat <laughs> in the middle of the water on a phone that none of us had ever heard ring before. And I was like, wow, that's quite impressive. <laughs> Is all I could think from that. But um, after that tour of duty uh, came to a close, I came back stateside and um, Fox and I reunited yet again. Uh, but this time we reunited with the intention of uh, of taking our relationship to the next stage. And uh, I proposed to her. She accepted uh, and we uh, forewent uh, the fancy wedding and the traditional uh, ways that people tend to get married. And we decided to elope. Um, and we uh, went off to a, a small chapel in uh, Kissimmee, St. Cloud, Florida, that Fox had uh, found on, uh, this is before the internet yeah, and all that other stuff. No, internet had just started. <laughs> I found it online. So, yeah. <laughs> so she found this place, and that is uh, ultimately where we went to uh, exchange our nuptials. Uh, we got there, and it was a beautiful little chapel, and we got married. We played songs that, them. right, you know, we, we played songs that, you know, brought in uh, what we thought was the, um, you know, uh, was the biggest moment of our lives. We spent the rest of the day at uh, Paradise I Treasure oh, Island, Pleasure I'm sorry, Island. which used to be a destination uh, location at uh, Disney World. And uh, we spent time there. We got a um, uh, welcome committee uh, that was there, you know, a bunch of revelers. so many people uh, We there. climbed up like, on top of a stage. Hearing us song like, oh, you guys got married. You guys got right. married. We're like dancing on this place you're not even supposed to be on. We right. don't care. We just. So like, we climbed all the way up. Imagine about 15, 20 feet in the air that we had climbed up on top on top of a, a, teleprompter, a yeah, teleprompter after I had reached out to the DJ who was out there DJing and got him to play a song. I said, man, me and my girl just got married man can you play a song for us and uh he's like well, what are you thinking i'm like oh no just figure out something man something that feels good so the next thing i know all of a sudden tony tony tony's it feels good comes on the uh, on the airway and uh fox and i started climbing up this thing and everybody's like man, what the hell are they doing and we got up on top and we danced and by the time we came down it was almost like the scene that you see in a concert where people jump into the crowd and then they kind of uh float you over the crowd by carrying you over uh, we got drunk with a bunch of uh, people that uh, kept buying us drinks <laughs> later on in that night. And uh, if that wasn't enough, we consummated our marriage by bungee jumping and videotaping it. And uh, we came back home uh, with the uh, with the intention of uh, a building for a of building the American dream. Yeah, uh, we wanted a White House with a picket fence and two point five kids. Didn't know what the hell that looks like. Uh, maybe that meant we had two, and then she had one in the oven. Uh, something <laughs> of the sort. <laughs> <laughs> so we were buying, uh, buying uh, clothing on our on our uh, what would become our family's first home uh, immediately after returning uh, back from uh, from our, uh, honeymoon. our honeymoon, and uh, maybe a week or so thereafter, uh, we started a uh, we found a location that would become our family's first business, and that was Culture uh, Shreveport's original hip hop clothing store. And uh, just when you know we thought that everything was about to be fine, uh, as it said that Murphy's Law happened and everything that could happen. Happen. happen and more. And more. Uh, that beautiful home that we bought, we realized that it was a lemon. Uh, the crown uh, foundation was cracked. There was additions made to the house that probably didn't pass speculations uh, inspection. And with that being said, the first rain that we got in the area, flooded it literally out flooded house. out the whole house. Wow. The new carpets that we had laid, the furnishings Painted we had everything. bought, the paints we had put on the wall, the, all of our hard work literally was washed out in uh in in one storm coupled with that we had our, our third oldest son uh was diagnosed with ailments that doctors could not figure out he was having undiagnosed seizures uh that we could not explain and to cap it all off we was like well we still got to keep pushing forward we went out to uh what is uh even still today one of the uh, one of the largest trade shows uh, for retailers and that is the uh magic show where we went out to buy inventory for uh, for our what would be our our family's uh, first store. And uh, we got back home only to find out that the investor had pulled out on us. So we went forward anyway. But can you imagine, man, uh, when we talked about the house and all of what that turned out to be, we made the worst mistake in business. We defied the top three rules of business when it, we thought yeah. to open up this business. And that is location, location, location. Right, we right. Bought we bought a, a building that was in an industrial complex or area that had been district 
uh, as an industrial, as an industrial area. area. And we thought to open up a retail clothing store there. Not talk about learning, Kurt. <laughs> and then if that was it's like the first three months of our marriage, if right. that wasn't enough, the uh, I'm teaching as a professor at the um, local university. Uh, at the end of the summer session, they um, do away with the program that I'm teaching it. So now I have no job. Yeah. So it was like one thing after another. I remember when we first married and um, found ourselves in this situation and made this poor decision. Rob said to me, um, well, Fox, we made a commitment for better or for worse. Did you think the better was going to come first? And I paused, Marcel, and I was like, well, hell yeah. I mean, I can at least get like you know, maybe like seven good years in and, you know, definitely not six months before all hell breaks loose. But all of that came uh, came tumbling down on us. We found ourselves in the uh, in the in the pits of uh, in, in the valley, yeah. you know, and with that being said, uh, the valley representing desperation. And uh, we were so desperate of a family at that moment. Uh, things were really uh, bottomed up. And um, as uh, the old saying goes that, you know, desperate people do desperate things. And we thought to regain financial solvency. Uh, by by robbing a bank. Yeah. Well, before we get that get to that, I'm I'm curious. Did the investor? I mean, the investor had committed fifty grand to help you help help fund your startup culture. Did he give you a reason why he pulled out? Pulled back. We actually, ended up. You know, it's just like you pay attention, and the answers that you need will come to you. We really could not even fathom why he had done this. I mean, he had offered. It was a friend of mine from the business community because as soon as I finished my master's, I moved home to Shreveport and got actively engaged in the business community because I always knew I wanted my own business, and um, so did Rob. And so he was a friend of mine, an acquaintance of mine that had told me whenever you get ready to launch your first business, then I'm here to help. You know, I've got 50,000. I'll commit to whatever it is that you want to do. We met with his accountant. They, we went through the numbers, the whole nine. It was all a go. And as soon as we got back, it was no. But what I realized was that um, he made the commitment to me. And at that time, I was not married. And so then when I bring my husband around, it became a different story. Maybe like six months to a year later, I ran into a woman in the business community that knew him. He had mentioned the woman to me before, but he was a woman that she was a woman that he had helped get a store open. And it was because he actually thought that the woman was going to be his woman. So it wasn't about helping someone in the business community. It was really about a man thinking that with my money, I'm going to buy me a woman. Um, and, and, and if I do this for you, you, then you'll do that for me. And, um, you know, just really disappointing because here I was thinking that this member of my community just really wanted to see me succeed. And all along, he was just an old dude that was trying to, you know, get him some relations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So help me understand the, the mindset here. Okay. Rob, you had no priors and Fox, I mean, you're college educated and, and here you are at this point of desperation and but I'm thinking, you know, there's a lot of different options that would come before even the thought enters your mind. I'm going to rob a bank today. <laughs> so at what point did you did that thought enter your mind? I mean, talk to me about the state of mind of somebody that gets to that point where they think, hey, should we rob a bank? Well, you know, Marcel, it, doesn't really, uh, it, it never really happens that way. You don't just wake up one day and say, hey, I'm going to go rob a bank. There are things that kind of ultimately ease you into that space. And for us, I mean, we had exhausted all of uh, what we thought to be uh, ways that we would uh, uh, circumvent uh, the uh, investor pulling out. Uh, we sought uh, bank loans. Uh, we sought uh, non-traditional loans uh, through family members and friends that we thought that we could pull together a, uh, a consortium of investors that would buy into the idea. But it would probably be, be as hard of a sale as maybe Facebook or MySpace or any of those things may have been to, uh, you know, people that come from, uh, you know, the uh, the sunflower generation. It's like, what? You know, you're going to do what? You know, so opening up a hip hop clothing store in the northwest uh, region of Louisiana, uh, they were probably trying to figure out, like, what the heck is that? Are y'all losing Are your mind? Like, what? I've never heard of such. Right. You know, so you got to figure that in 1997, mid 90s, you're talking about a cultural phenomenon that was basically taking flight 
at the, you know, in similar fashion that technology has taken flight, you know, what they are with the older generation of people that, you know, had never been introduced to that type of stuff. Uh, so what we were trying to sell was uh, was indeed a hard sell for people that had never, you know, experienced this, uh, you know, culturally. Uh, so, you know, with that being said, like I said, we had exhausted uh, a lot of avenues uh, that we thought would lead to, um, you know, the uh, traditional ways that people get businesses started. And banks uh, were rejecting you guys as well, probably for the same yeah, reasons, right? Exactly. You know, we had no no history. Uh, we had no, enough to buy a house right. and a car, but not enough to get a business loan. Right. Uh, and seemingly we found that many of those processes are filtered a different kind of way. You know, banks seemingly give you loans to put you in debt. You know, they'll give you a, a loan for a house. Uh, they'll give you a loan for a car, you know, things that diminish almost immediately the moment that you assume them. But very, it's a very different process that we found when it comes to you talking about buying something that in return makes a profit that turns into something potentially that is a, you know, a cash cow. And uh, that, you know, again, like I said, it's just been our experience. And uh coupled with uh, when you're talking about culturally, uh, all of the other things that uh, have a way of kind of playing into that. Uh, if you go back in time, or I think this is uh, uh, important in time, uh, when you start talking about movies like uh, Point Break uh, with um, Keanu Reeves that played uh, um, The Matrix, uh, yeah. they had a bunch of them dressing up like presidents. Uh, they were surfers by day and they go in and they rob banks uh, during their off time and then they spend all of the money going off surfing. Right. Uh, you had dead presidents, you know, with uh, with a team of people that had come back from Vietnam and got back home and realized that the country that they had fought for did not have a return plan for them. And then they sought financial uh, solvency by robbing a bank. Then you got uh, the women and uh, set it off with uh, Queen Latifah and an encore presentation from her and several other young black women who had found themselves against all odds. Uh, single parent mothers and so forth and thought that they too would regain financial solvency by robbing a bank, thinking that that was the fix to it all. It wasn't until later on in life that I realized that the American dream syndrome or urban survival syndrome is in fact a real science. It's a soft science. It's not a hard science, but it is the foolish desire. And this is my definition of it, but it's the foolish desire to uh, to achieve the the uh, the American dream by all means necessary. Yeah. And all right. what happens is that we just find ourselves in those moments when we're just on the cusp or the brink of success. And it's like something is like pushing you just further and further and further back away from it. And then you do something um, crazy in your efforts to achieve it. Take us back to the day. I mean, and both of uh, Fox, you had a role in it as well. <laughs> so walk us through what happened in that bank robbery. Well, I think that um, most of the gory details of it can be found in time, the book. You know, we don't want to go um, sentence for sentence about what happened on that day and not leave something for the viewers to enjoy when they take time out to read the book because um, the book is a true masterpiece. And I don't say that because Rob and I wrote it in alternating voices, but it's a masterpiece because it allows ordinary people like us to do it, to see how it is that you can do, uh, um, how extraordinary things can be done through us. Um, ordinary people. And so I think it was just the challenge of you reaching your breaking point and saying that this is it, we got to do this or we're going to lose everything else. The, the motivating thought was that if we could just secure the finances that we need, we could save our family. And after the incident occurred, the very thing that we thought we were doing to save our family literally destroyed our family with our own hands. And in that moment, when I watched the ambulance pass by, when I heard gunshots had been fired, the, the fleet, your life passes before you very quickly. And then I realized that everything that we needed, we already had. We had each other. Even if we were sleeping under a bridge till we could regain ourselves, we had each other and we had our freedom. And it was family over everything else. And 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 that family is everything. And, um, and we put that aside thinking that we needed these other things to save and to maintain our family. Yeah, yeah. So looking back, maybe a few weeks after that event, were you guys surprised that you had gone that far? No, immediately. Mm. 
Mm. Oh, immediately. Immediately. It didn't, it didn't take um, the three weeks. It was no, uh, for it was her. Immediately. It was the moment that she heard the sirens for me. It was the moment she got in the backseat of the police car uh, that I came to the realization that, wow, this and that really could have turned out bad. For me, that temporary insanity piece that they talked about, I always thought that that was some, you know, some jive. But man, I, you know, in that moment, it's like you shook back into reality. Um, and you say, I did. How, how did I get you? you know, when I was thinking that because I went to Grambling and the bank that we uh, um, robbed was the bank in Grambling where I had gone to college. And then I even banked there. So I'm like, oh, my goodness. You know, uh, I knew those people. Uh, are they OK? Um, uh, oh, I know that must have really shook them up to be threatened in that manner. Uh, even though Robert had no intention whatsoever of, of causing harm. Just the fact that you brandish a firearm and threaten people for money is harmful enough. Right. Right. And so it was an instant moment of saying, oh, my goodness, what in the world have we done? And it would take us 21 years and four days before we could fix it. And it's still not fixed. We're still working on it. Every day you still live with the people that want you to be shamed for what you did. The people that feel like you can never um, that you are. Uh, I believe that I'm more than the worst thing I have done, Marcel. And it's people in our society that, you know, they're so busy pointing the finger at you that they can't see the four fingers that are pointing back at them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to jump to. And by the way, listeners, I mean, there are so many details, just like Fox said, about all of the events leading up to the bank robbery and the details of the bank robbery and what happens afterwards. Uh, the book does a great job because it comes, <laughs> it's written from your voice. So the details are vivid and written in everyday language. That everybody can understand. So get the book to get all of the, all of the details in between. So I want to jump to really the trial period. You know, you, so now you, you're, you're in jail, you're awaiting trial, Rob, uh, I think you as well, Fox, because you were part of that yes. of that robbery attempt. <laughs> so talk about what you experienced during the trial, you know, that led to your sentence. Mm -hmm. Well, I think a lot of people don't uh, actually understand. And I say that when I say a lot of people is, is those that have had an opportunity to watch the documentary. The documentary kind of gives these broad strokes over what our experience was like, but um, leaves out a lot of detail in terms of uh, what that looked like. They know that I received 60 years, but what they do not know is that I actually pled guilty to the charges. I pled guilty to the charges and accepted a plea offer in exchange for, um, you know, for my my part. Uh, in the uh, in the matter, uh, they had a uh, overzealous uh, prosecutor that had been brought in and a money hungry attorney uh, that had been brought in as well to uh, to represent me that my family had hired. And um, that just made for a really bad mix. Uh, bad mix meant uh, ultimately that my uh, money hungry lawyer ended up fumbling the plea bargain that had already been negotiated for me. Uh, and at the same time, the overzealous prosecutor uh, pushed past trying to offer uh, any uh, uh, alternative deals and said, well, we'll just crank this thing up and go to trial. And um, once it uh, it was kind of like a uh, like a, a horse that had broken loose from uh, from the wagon. I mean, it was headed back to the stables and uh, man, uh, for anybody that has ever seen something like that, uh, it is a, a mad dash to, uh, you know, to uh, to a place. And that place was uh, to the pits of hell. This, this prosecutor, I mean, uh, man, he pulled out all stops. He overlooked the fact that I had military service. He overlooked the fact that we had children. He overlooked the fact that we had college educations prior to. He even overlooked the fact of the uh, of the pre-sentence investigation that is done in a, um, in a in a criminal matter where uh, the authorities come in uh, from uh, probation and parole, they come in and they make an assessment and they issue out or issue recommendations to the court in terms of what they think would be a proper uh, sanction for the offense itself. And in looking at all of the mitigating uh, circumstances uh, as they related to our circumstances, they came back with a recommendation that said that they thought I would have uh, been better off uh, going to a, a boot camp program for six months and then do the remaining time on uh, on supervised parole. Um, but in order to do so, I would have had to get a seven-year sentence or less. The minimum sentence that I could have uh, received 
was uh, five years for armed robbery and or they could have sidestepped it and then given me a uh, a different form of robbery charge that would have allowed me to face no time in or zero years in terms of prison time, but yet could have, again, sent me to the uh, to the intensive uh, boot camp program. And then the remaining time I would have done on a uh, supervised intensive parole. Supervised parole. Right. So uh, again, like I said, they sidestepped all of that. They sidestepped the uh, the victim's uh, wishes and the victims uh, were calling for no more than a 10 year sentence uh, in my matter, you know, with good time uh, and decided to push forward to a trial. And when you start talking about going to trial, you now start talking about state. Uh, when you start talking about the administration of justice, uh, that requ- it, it's money involved in that. So for a case to go to trial, at least during that time, you know, it was a minimum of about twenty five thousand dollars that uh, the state spends to uh, even prepare a, uh, a case for trial. And in exchange, you pay uh, that debt uh, with your time, with your life. And uh, it just uh, really turned out to be a bad deal, you know, in the end, because uh, the amount of time that I paid for the amount of for the infraction, I think, was uh, really out of order, you know, uh, Yeah. All right. So um, a moment of reality here. So I want to be real here because uh, I know this. I know systemic racism exists. Okay. I want to know how much of that play a factor in in the trial process and the sentencing. I think it plays a a big part when you consider the fact that both in our uh, any of our uh, states as well as our uh, federal constitutions, uh, slavery has been abolished in America. But there is an exception. The exception is when you've been duly convicted of a crime. And I, like others, like like 2.3 million other people that are, um, you know, in this condition now, we go back into slavery. I went back to making four cents an hour. I went back to working in fields. I went back to being oversaw by uh, by gun guards and uh, forced to uh, to do hard labor. I went back to living in uh, in shanty shacks warehouse with over a hundred other men inside of a dormitory setting, 500 men on a pod, 6,000 men that made up the total population of the prison that I was at. And it was on 18,000 sprawling acres of some of the best land you could ever, you could ever think of. In fact, Angola State Penitentiary is the same ground uh, that a, um, a, a slave breeding ground used to be there prior to the prison. And it got its name from the uh, from Angola, Africa, where they ship slaves into this territory. And then from there, right. they ship them up the river to New Orleans down on the uh, on the auction blocks uh, uh, in the uh, in the quarters where they uh, where they traded them off and they sent them all across the country to do hard labor on plantations and farms all across the country. So uh, when you think about that and then you say about systemic racism, whenever this is at play, then you have to at least consider that there is some racism that is uh, that is at play here, because uh, even during times that um, Fox had managed to get people to go and speak to the D.A. on my behalf, the answers that he gave was that I sent him to Angola to die. And that's what that's what I intend for him to do. Wow. For taking five thousand dollars, that's what you intend to do. Wow. What's what's fascinating is that if I was having this conversation with you in the 1940s or 50s, you know, I'm I'm thinking there's there's probably some real. uh, Yeah, I can see how that may have happened. This is the 21st century in the United States of America. And um, and this this is still going on. So fascinating. So now you're in. Yeah. I mean, just even when you think about my part, um, Marcel, um, which I talk about in the book, but my role in this um, crime was I dropped Rob and his nephew off at the bank and then I drove off, went and looked and then Rob says, you just leave. And uh, I was supposed to be the lookout after they went to the bank. He asked me to just leave and um, he would figure out how they were going to get back home. Well, for my role in that, the plea deal that the D.A. offered my lawyer was 40 years in prison. 40 years. 40 years. Just 40. for dropping us off. Like, uh, not shooting nobody, not not balling up their bodies and dumping them somewhere. But for dropping them off at the bank, he thought that a plea deal for me, would be 40 years. Right. 
And so just like you, I'm a college educated woman. Um, nobody in my family on my mother's side had ever been to prison. You know, my daddy, they come from a, a, a unique mix of um, street culture from the time, the era that he grew up in. Um, but this was not a common way of life for what I had experienced as a young child. So I honestly thought that the judicial system was fair. And it wasn't until I got into the small town of Lincoln Parish in Ruston, Louisiana, that I realized that, wow, literally, just like you, this, wow, this, I thought they did this in the 40s and the 50s. You mean they really are still lynching Black people, but instead of from trees, they're doing it in the courts? From in, yeah, right. I right. want to say this part, uh, Marcel, before we move on, just in case uh, you were like me and just did not want to believe it. It wasn't until I received the sentence for jury tampering. Jury tampering carries the same exact amount of time for the uh, for the crime that the jury has been in panel to hear. So for the armed robbery, we were facing five to 99 years. So now jury tampering now counts for five to 99 years. And we had two counts. So we were facing 297 years in prison. When I got the deal for the jury tampering charge, the DA says, man, today's your lucky day. He says, I'm offering a deal. He says, I'm only offering this deal one time. I'm going to give you two five-year sentences. One of them I'm going to allow to run in with the time that you're already doing for the uh, for the armed robbery. He says, in the other one, I'm going to suspend four of those years and leave you with one to do it. I'm going to run it separate from the 60 years that you're doing for the armed robbery. He said, that'll be 61 years because, my friend, that was the last time that uh, jury tampering happened in our town. And he says, that'll give you something to think about while you're down there on that river. It'll give you something to think about. So 61 years from 1938 to 1999, when I when I was sentenced, was 61 years. So when you ask the question about systemic racism for a prosecutor, somebody that has been placed into a position a of authority, that has been placed into a position of leadership, that has been placed into a position of trust, that this is the response that we get from this particular prosecutor, but it's not as rare of a situation as we think it is because there was another gentleman that was also on the sentencing docket that it ended up in front of a judge. And he had his, his crime is that he went into a, a convenience store and he stole a candy bar. And on the day of sentencing, he got sentenced and the judge says, you know, today is they your lucky day. Him they multi build him for his third, theft. for his third petty offense. And they said that if this would have been a king size sneaker bar, your sentence today would have been life. But he gave him like 40, 50 years. But he gave, him, he gave him 40 years, though, for stealing a sneaker bar. Third offense theft. Third offense, petty theft crime. And petty theft is anything less than 500 bucks. Holy cow. And that's in the 21st century. That's not 1940, right. not 1912. None of that, not the 1800s. This is in the 21st century that we're talking about. Yeah. Rob, so now you're you're in prison and it, it, this prison is dubbed Amer the America's bloodiest penitentiary, right? We're talking about Angola. What do you remember most about that place? Oh man, um probably mm -hmm. just the fact that it is uh it is the home of where uh where my um my ancestors land. Uh, knowing that they had been dispersed to uh, work on plantations all across this country. Um, and even in the midst of that, it is also the uh, this place where I came to the realization that if they had endured more than four, 400 years of chattel slavery in this country, then I could uh, figure out a way to endure a 60 year sentence under the new form of, uh, of slavery, that being mass incarceration on the same ground. So it was tapping into uh, the DNA uh, that ran through my veins and many of the other men that have been confined to that place to figure out how to overcome a place like that. So uh, much like uh, many of the people that we see in the Bible that have been subjects uh, to incarceration, that being Joseph, one of the very first people when we opened the book of the Bible uh, that we realized that had been uh, sent off into slavery. Uh, the ones that uh, Moses and Aaron sought to free uh, from slavery. Uh, when you think about uh, the afflictions of uh, of Job, uh, when you think about the uh, murderous rampages of a person like Paul who had experienced transformation, when you think about the wrongful conviction of Jesus Christ, uh, all of these are stories that I that I was able to tap into and find um, 
you know, some solace. And it was probably when I read the uh, book by Viktor Frankl, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. Of course. Uh, I came to the realization that if this man could overcome a concentration camp in his particular experience, you know, uh, having experiences similar to my own, then I knew that I could also overcome uh, the conditions uh, that that I faced uh, in Angola State Penitentiary. So I sought to better myself, you know, every day. I woke up every day with with the thought of bettering myself despite the circumstances. I thought about ways that I could create an economy even inside a prison, even though I was only making four cents an hour. I figured out ways that I could generate and be uh, be impactful and be present financially for my family, even though they were on the other side of uh on the other side of these gates and walls that uh, that held, held me bound. So uh, I started finding uh, creative ways uh, to be a contributing member to my family uh, in, you know, and in a, in a meaningful way. Uh, so that then be kind of came a pursuit of my own that uh, that led me, you know, from day to day that kept me inspired, uh, along with, uh, you know, the love that I received from my family who uh, who didn't let go of my hand through this uh you know, through, through this horrible, uh, horrible experience. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Fox, I want to jump to you because I'm so curious as a single mom <clears throat> now, um, as you know, once once Rob was sentenced, you were supporting you had to support six boys. And on top of that, you're homeschooling them, right? Yes. Between public school, homeschooling, um, we private school, we had all of the systems experience. It just depend on what needed to work for our family in the moment. Um, we were self-employed as a family. And so um, it was kind of like working a farm and is what I would compare it to in days of old, where before the children would have to go to school, they'd have to milk the cow. They'd have some chores that they had to do to help maintain the farm before they would go and get their education. Well, it was the same for us whatever business we were doing, whether it was me traveling and speaking or whether it was when we owned a small car lot, um, all of the boys had to contribute to what we were doing to feed ourselves as a family. So I think the biggest thing um, that that allowed me to raise six successful young men um, through 21 years of incarceration was the fact that I always gave our children their truth. Our family is an incarcerated family but it's our family. We are more than the worst thing that we have ever done. So we're not gonna bow our heads. We're gonna look people in the eyes and we're gonna speak our truth unabashedly and unashamed. And so just being able to give them the vote of confidence and a relationship with their father. I, I had so many challenges from members of my own family and community like, oh, you still driving those boys down there? You know, sometimes my mother would say to me, you know, you gonna drag those boys Boys don't want to go down to that prison and sit all day. You know, those were the types of um, obstacles that I would find myself up against. But what I understood is that Rob was my husband. And no matter where my husband was, that's where my family was. And so if he couldn't come be with us for Christmas, then we would go spend our Christmas with him. If he couldn't be with us for Thanksgiving, then our Thanksgiving day would be spent with him because wherever he was is where our family was. And so being able to keep the ties between his children and him and us, it gave our children a solid foundation of family and of love despite the incarceration. And so when I would hear my children come back and say to us, man, you know, um, dad, you know, I just want to let you know how much I appreciate you because such and such father's at home with him and, and I'm closer to you than his dad is, you know, than he and his dad are and his dad is in the home or the boys would say, man, you know, mommy daddy you guys get along better than most of my friends parents get along you know so those types of things that says that even though we were an incarcerated family we could still put forth a good demonstration of what a family is supposed to be like and uh and let love continue to guide us and love get us through this yeah and love you know we talk about radical love to the point where you know at at, at some point in your journey you realize that if I don't do something to fight for the release of my husband. He's just going to rot in jail for 60 years. Right. So talk to us a little bit about that. I mean, at, at what point did you realize, no, it's up to me. I got to, I got to do something and, and advocate for his release. 
Yeah, it was immediately when I got home from prison, I knew I had an obligation. We made this decision together. And and the weight of me as a woman, uh, my husband being a man and wanting to be the provider and the the system, you know, that that says you are the one that's supposed to be the head of the household. Well, I felt um I felt like I had failed my family because as a woman, I also should have protected my family and said, you know, no, I'm not gonna allow you to do that. No, this is not I'm not gonna put you allow you to be put in harm's way like that because you're too valuable to our family. But since I didn't say that, then I had a duty and an obligation to bring him home. We went in this together and God sakes, we were going to come out of this together as a family. And that was a commitment that we made day one. And so with that being said, as soon as I got home from prison, uh, I immediately went to work trying to figure out how do we eat? How do I provide for us? keep my children where the impact of incarceration doesn't overcome or overwhelm them, that our poor decision-making doesn't snuff the life out of them before they even get started. And then how do I take on the whole state of Louisiana for my family's freedom? And so you trust the process. And I started showing up at the state capitol, had never been before, not even on a field trip. (laughs) <laughs> and then I became an actual regular in the halls of the state legislature talking to, to lawmakers about laws that needed to change that had impact my family and would spend 20 years down there um, talking to this one, talking to that one, trying to get laws passed. And as God would have it, when you're doing the right thing, just the next right thing, help will come for you. It says Henry David Thoreau said, when you advance confidently in the direction of your dream, you will be met with success of uncommon hours. And so it was 2017, and I'm not going to spoil it because it was in the book, but 2017, I'm at the Capitol and the last opportunity for freedom that we had had had, had died in in committee, never made it out of the committee and uh, at the legislature. And um, when I walked out of there, I called my son Freedom, who was at a speaking event. um, And there at the speaking event was none other than Frank Luntz, a Republican pundit from California. And who else was in the room that night was our governor. And my 17 year old son, who was a student at Tulane at the time, stood up and asked Mr. Luntz a question to which Mr. Luntz said, hey kid, what are you doing here in a suit this time of night? I'm not even in a suit. Don't leave, kid. I'm going to change your life tonight. Man. <clears throat> and wow. That, that was the pivot. Yeah. At what point did um, did the governor, I mean, the governor gave clemency, right? Uh, and I know I don't want to spoil it either uh, because I want point to point people to the book. But your sentence was reduced from 60 years. Was that right? No, no, no. no. Now, that's a whole nother part of the story you got to read in the book. Yep. In 2017, um, Mr. Luntz met with us and um, said that uh, our son, Freedom, was the most impressive person that he had ever met in the past 25 years. And he wanted to know what he could do to help Freedom, to which Freedom told him, my father's incarcerated. And we need him home, not for me, but for my younger brother, because he deserves a chance to grow up with our father. And so from that point, Mr. Lon says, well, I've got a meeting with your governor coming up at the convening of governors. And I have never asked these people for anything, but I'm going to speak to your governor when I see him um, because he's asked to talk to me. And I'm going to speak to him about your family. And so at that point, the governor told Frank, um, Mr. Luntz, he says, you, um, if they get past my pardon board, you have my word that um, that I'll sign their pardon, their clemency. What happened at the clemency hearing the following year, when we finally got our hearing in place, it took a year. Um, what happened at that hearing was that the team from the New York Times that we were working with on the documentary time, because at this time, um, the time which became the movie was just supposed to be a 15 minute op doc for the New York Times. And the filmmaker, I had specifically told them, do not bring out those cameras at this hearing whatsoever. Do not until this is over, bring out those cameras. Right. 
How about the overzealous camera person set up the camera at the beginning of the hearing as soon as we went in and everything went ablaze. These people now knew we were filming them. One of the worst things that you can do in the criminal justice system or to people that Especially are- Especially in the deep south. That's right. <sighs> they were insulted. They were humiliated. They were, uh, they were angry at us and they handled us so bad before that pardon board. You would have thought my husband was the worst thing that had ever come before them. And in 21 years of serving time, this gentleman had one write-up in 21 years. I did two and a half years um, in prison and I had about four write-ups for stupid mm. stuff like leaving my bed unmade, wearing shorts before three o'clock on the yard. This guy had one write-up and it was about something I had on my website about him in 2009. Mm. So, you know, for them to not decrease his sentence, what they did was is that they uh, Release me on, on they, immediate parole They immediately elevated his parole eligibility to let him out on parole. But Rob still has 40 years of parole for the, the rest of his sentence. Is that right? Yeah. Mm. Now, they did they do that? They turned around, they slapped a curfew on him. If he's not working, he's got to be in the house by nine o'clock at night, can't leave home till six o'clock in the morning. I'm talking about somebody that did not take a life that's how they treated us when they found out that Rob, that we were filming that documentary. So people think, oh, you make money off your story. You're not supposed to make money off your story. We pay dearly, dearly for telling our story Yeah, because yeah. we're still not free. Fox, in 21 years, did you ever have a time when you just felt like giving up? No. I was tired, but giving up wasn't an option for me. Yeah. Well, not if to give up would let the state win. To give up would mean my husband would die there. To give up would mean my children would never know what it's like to have their father home. Giving up was never an option. Never an option. Yeah. Talk a little bit about faith. <laughs> this is not a podcast where we delve deep into uh, you know, faith conversations, but I think that you can't not have a conversation like this and uh, go through that kind of ordeal without really examining the faith life and how that carried you both through. So touch on that a little bit. You know, I think that one of the things that we failed to do, and even Rob and I in the beginning of our journey was to count the wins. Every day that we wake up and we are in our right state of mind and we've got our health and our strength and somebody that loves us, that's a win. We start to pay off with the win. And so when you um, see so much defeat on your journey, you learn real quickly, like Victor Franco talks about in his book, you learn real quickly to count the small wins along the way because they sh they they remind you that God is with you and they remind you, you know, just that little bit of help, that little bit of nugget, that power pellet to keep you going to the next one and the next one. And so for us, it was about making sure that we could count the wins, even in the midst of all the losses, that we were still healed, we were still together, we were still healthy, we were still strong, and, um, and we were still in the fight. Mm -hmm. Every day that we were still in the fight and that Sometimes taking on the biggest obstacles, if, if the win in life is easy, we'll have no appreciation for it. But man, what a victory story. We get a chance to tell other people and inspire other people. And what it gives us a chance to really serve as a testament to other human beings about the indestructibility of the human spirit. We all are powerful. We just have to tap into our DNA, that, that DNA that even created this life force in the first place. We don't tell our hearts to beat, Marcel. Seldom do we tell our lungs to expand and deflate. We don't tell our intestines to digest our food. We are amazingly, perfectly operating human beings. And we just forget that. Yeah, yeah. I want you guys to touch a little bit about this very important ministry of yours. Um, tell me again what it is and how you help those that have been in similar situations. 
while I was incarcerated uh, again and uh, trying to make the best of a bad situation, I took a uh, a four year degree that was uh, being offered to men inside of the prison uh, in uh, pastoral. Uh, what well, was uh, a theology degree? But uh, once you finish, you would have a four year and two year degree, respectively, in uh, pastoral ministry and Christian counseling. Uh, with that being said, uh, while you're taking the program, you have to create a ministry while inside the prison. And I started a social justice ministry while I was inside of the prison, advocating and talking to uh, men about ways and avenues to uh, to relieve themselves of the uh, of the burden of prison. Uh, with that being said, uh, probably the biggest takeaway that Fox and I both uh, glean from having both been incarcerated it is that uh, to be free is to free others. And with that being said, about six months after I came home, we uh, started uh, what would become um, our first uh, our first ministry. And that ministry being Rich Family Ministries, whose first initiative is uh, PDM NOLA. PDM NOLA is an acronym for Participatory Defense Movement NOLA, where we teach legal awareness as a best form of defense to justice-involved people. Uh, we are just one of 40 hubs that exist throughout the country. And uh, we do just that. And uh, we measure the success of our organization by the amount of time that we save an individual, opposed to the amount of time that they have been sanctioned to serve. And uh, since the inception of our organization, April the 11th, 2019, we have saved more than 3,300 years of people doing time. Uh, so that is uh, the way that we strive and work to give back to others. Um, we have a wealth of experience uh, that we learn through, uh, through trial and error. And what we uh, strive to do is to use that experience uh, to give to others um, with hopes that they would circumvent a lot of the um, the time uh, that, you know, it takes to uh, undo uh, prison sentences. You know, they say uh, my mom uh, used to say and older people used to say that trouble is easy to get into, but uh, it's the dickens to get out of. You know, so um, time is valuable. And no matter, you know, how or what type of conditions we're born in, whether we're born as into queens and uh, and, and, and kings, uh, whether we're born to the parents of presidents and first ladies or uh, whether we're born in the, uh, in, in the, in the pits of hell, of, you know, of our nation's projects, all of us have a limited amount of time that we're going to be given on this on this planet. And the unfortunate piece of it is, is that no matter what your condition is, you don't necessarily know when it's going to uh, expire. Yeah. Yeah. With that being said, time is uh, it's a valuable commodity and we work to try to preserve it, you know, for others by by making sure that we can save as much time of uh, of people and their uh, and their transgressions uh, with hopes that they would be on be able to get on to get on with their lives and uh, make something doing. Yeah. Rob, looking back at uh, learning from all your experiences, what would you say is the best piece of advice you could give for somebody that maybe, you know, maybe maybe they feel like, you know, I'm out of options here? I would have to say that uh, for us, uh, what proved to be true, uh, there's a saying that God is love and love is God. So it means that they're equal to one another. They have the same amount. They have the same forces, uh, the same powers and the whole nine yards. So it would have to be that love conquers all. Uh, it overcomes prison walls. It overcomes uh, separation. Uh, it overcomes sickness. It overcomes addiction. addiction. It overcomes bad relationships. It yes, overcomes yes. dead end jobs. Mm -hmm. It overcomes uh, poor business choices. It overcomes failed business practices. Uh, the whole nine yards. We just have to, as Fox said, uh, employ love as the strategy. Yeah. And that's what we advocate for here is a love in the in the leadership sense, because we we see the the downfall of of leaders that don't lead with love and what kind of havoc that creates on businesses that fail in our uh, when love isn't present. Yes. Mm. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. All right, guys. So what is your ultimate hope for people reading this book? And I'm going to point that to the camera right now. There is if you're watching it on YouTube. <laughs> 
Um, for me, our ultimate hope when people finish reading our book is that love conquers all. Love is the most divine chemical in the universe, Marcel, and it dissolves everything that is not of itself. Love conquers all. Mm -hmm. So with that love, we hope we're hopeful that it's not just that fuzzy feeling that you feel when you think about the word of love, but it's uh it's uh, uh, uh an element, a thing that empowers. And we're hopeful that people will walk away having read the book, having watched the film, um, that they will walk away empowered, mm -hmm. you know, because we can overcome what we've been through. Then surely whatever it is that, you know, many of your viewers are faced with, they should be able to tap into love and hence become empowered enough to overcome whatever curveball that life may have thrown them. And exactly. love is not just about having somebody else to love you, but it's also just being in love with the life force that you you show up as. You know, just like the intelligence of a flower that blooms on its own with no instructions, we operate as fully functioning human beings. And so just being able to have a love and appreciation for the divine functioning of our own selves and our existence in this moment in time. Yeah. You know, what's fascinating is that love, uh, I'm with you, Rob, completely, Rob, uh, it, uh, love empowers you to act, to change a situation. And I see you both having done that so perfectly well, Rob, even inside the prison walls in the worst environment, you were able to transform yourself through love to become a, a whole new being. And Fox, without love, you would not have been able to advocate for your husband's release because that came from love from a deep deep place of love <laughs> right. um and then the love of just keep going and not give up despite the circumstances right because a lot of people would have just rolled over and said uh it's just the way the system is they would have just throw their hands in the air yeah. and you chose another path yeah. mm -hmm. And boy, has it paid off, Marcel. Mm -hmm. I even think about now, I don't know if your viewers can see these t-shirts that we're wearing, but it says Sybil Fox Richardson, <laughs> State, State House Representative, Representative for District 93. District, yes. District 93 represents the most powerful house district in our entire state. It holds all of the assets of this state, meaning the Superdome, the Smoothie King Center, French the quarters. Convention Center, the French Quarters, the CBD, the Port, all of that is in this district. And this woman, out of seven other candidates, millionaire included, she actually won first in the primaries and is off to a runoff that concludes on my birthday, March the 25th. So election day is March 25th. Early voting for this particular election starts tomorrow. And she wow. is a leading candidate. She has been endorsed by the gentleman who formerly vacated the seat, uh, who uh, recently vacated the seat and has become our, our state senator. She's also been endorsed by our U.S. senator. Uh, oh, she has been a uh, congressman. I'm sorry. She's been endorsed by practically all of our city council. She has been uh, is, uh, is uh, got endorsements from the, the entire uh, yeah. all of our hospitality workers, our labor unions. Uh, the uh, black talkers, you name it. I mean, they even the bums on the street uh, that live under the bridge. <laughs> the, the less home families, the less home families. Yeah. I, I absolutely love that you are bragging on your wife, rightfully so, because she deserves it. And by the way, congratulations, Fox, on that. And uh, yeah, we can't wait to see you win that that uh, and, and be in office um, in your district. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, as we wind down here, folks, we bring it home with two questions, as we do with every guest. Personally, what's really tugging at your heart right now that you would like us to know? And I'll start with you, Rob. That as Americans, we are the most industrialized, most advanced country in the world. And we collectively are impacted by slavery in this country, no matter what its form is. And just as slavery of old, I think that we should muster up the courage and confidence to move out of our comfort zones and do whatever it is that we need to do to eradicate slavery in all forms. That does not mean that we do away with our prisons. That does not mean that we do away with sanctioning those who transgress against, uh, against our society. But I think that as smart as we are as a nation, 
that we can find something better to do with human life when it has uh, when it has transgressed against our uh, rules and uh, regulations that we've set in place uh, to create our civilization. I know that we're smarter than that. Mm. Fox. She's, she's pointing at her husband. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm gonna sit with that one. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. Finally, gang, you close us out your way with that one key takeaway. Just summarize this whole conversation to keep us inspired. What would that be? You can't put a price on time, so you better use it wisely. Spend your life wisely. Well, <clears throat> I, t I said in the beginning, it was going to be a uh, one of those conversations where, uh, you know, it, it, we're, we kind of went off the beaten path a little bit from what we usually do. And I, I am so glad we did. It is a, a, a conversation that uh, I'm going to be listening to time and time again. It is a, a much needed and timely conversation. And uh, gosh, I hope that uh, this goes far and wide because people need to hear this message. So speaking of... Uh, far and wide, if I want to send <laughs> all kinds of people from faraway places to connect with you, where can they go? We are Fox and Rob. That's the common regular spelling, F-O-X-A-N-D-R-O-B uh, dot com and on all social media, Fox and Rob. And um, and our uh, ministry is richfamilyministries.org. So you can find out more about the work that we are doing to make lives better uh, there. But uh, Fox and Rob on all social media. And if you're in New Orleans, you know, you got to call us up, Marcel. Rob cooks a mean breakfast <laughs> and I'd wash the best dishes. <laughs> <laughs> Can't you wait. come March 25th, she will be the first, uh, I will be the first gentleman of the district, <laughs> yeah. and, she be, and she will be the state representative of this district. So do know that you, it would all be first class. Yes. Can't wait. Well, it's been an amazing conversation and uh, thank you so much. I appreciate you both to the heavens and uh, we're all much better for it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for having you. us. Yes. You can keep the conversation going on social media with hashtag love in action podcast and look for my show notes on my website, marcelschwantes.com. You'll find all the resources there to this episode, including the YouTube link to watch the show and all of Rob and Fox's contact info will be there as well. And hey, finally, we're always looking for sponsors to help us spread the love in action movement globally. So if you're interested, let's chat. Reach me on my website or find me on LinkedIn. Thank you for listening to the Love in Action podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it, subscribe, and leave us a review. Until next time, don't forget, the future of leadership is love in action. Believe it, practice it, and watch your business grow.